Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of the Bible Q&A with Pastor Stephen. My name is Stephen Pace, and I'm the senior pastor at Decatur Bible Church in Decatur, Michigan. This podcast attempts to answer Bible questions in a clear but thorough manner. If you would like to have a Bible-related question considered for a future episode, email me your question to pastorstephendbc at gmail.com. Again, that's pastor, S-T-E-B-E-N-D-B-C at gmail.com. In this episode, we're going to be looking at three Bible-related questions, so grab your Bibles and let's get started. Now, the first question for this episode is, Pastor, in reading 1 Corinthians 16.9, Paul refers to an open door. What is an open door, or what does the expression mean? Thanks. So let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we'll be looking at verses 7 through 9. Now, as you're turning there, this is, of course, the ending of a rather lengthy letter to the Corinthians. And Paul is explaining some of his, if you will, present future travel plans. So he's telling where he plans to go and those sorts of things. And Paul's plans, we might say today, are tentative, meaning that they could change But he wanted the Corinthians basically to know that he anticipated to return to them at some point, and he was going to return to Corinth, and he wanted to stay for a particular period of time. So the question arises out of that backdrop, and the specific reference to the question is in verse 9. But I think in order to understand it a little better, we're going to read verses 7 through 9 of 1 Corinthians 16. Paul says, For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits. But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, as you read that, based off of the background that I told you that he is telling Paul that is, various things related to his current, you would say, or future plans. He wants to return to them, but is going to remain in. Now, we also see that the reason for it is explained in verse 9. He says, for. So it's explanatory. He says, for a wide door or open door, depending on your translation, has appeared to him or for him. You'll see, depending on the translation you have, I'm reading from the New American Standard, the 95. Paul says that the reason he's going to remain in Ephesus is a wide or open door for effective service has been provided to him. So what you see here is that the answer is what Paul is referring to as whether it be open or wide, he's using a metaphor which is for, to say that there was an opportunity that he had for effective ministry service there. So the idea there of a door would be, and the answer to the question is that it refers to some type of opportunity. Let's look at a few other examples. In fact, let's turn to Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, and you can really see this come out here very clear. Same idea, speaking of, if you will, travel. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord... So there you see the same idea. Now, of course, geographically it's different. It's Troas, and it's related to the gospel of Christ, and the door was opened for him by the Lord. So again, he had an opportunity there in relation to Troas and the gospel. 
We also can see this in another of his writings in Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, as he's drawing the letter to a close, he says, Colossians chapter 4, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have been also imprisoned. So Paul here has been asking them to devote themselves to prayer. You see that in verse 2, to be continuing having an attitude of thanksgiving. But as they pray, he says, pray that the Lord opens up a door for the word, meaning that either opportunity for the word and the message of the gospel of Christ and uh, all of those types of things associated with the word, that there would be an opportunity to do that. Now, you'll also find another example of this in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. So again, we've got two other references by Paul, 2 Corinthians 2.12, Colossians 4.3, and then in the book of Revelation chapter 3 and in verse 8. Now, I will mention before we move on that in the question, 1 Corinthians 16.9, it's interesting because even though Paul saw that there were adversaries, it did not stop him from following the Lord's direction. And I think that helps explain the question and answer a little bit better as well because Paul knew that the Lord had given him an opportunity, a door, if you will, for ministry there. But he also knew that that would entail difficulties or adversaries. Henry writes, adversaries and opposition do not break the spirits of faithful ministers, but only rekindle their zeal. And that's true. I mean, we shouldn't, when the Lord gives us clear opportunities to share the gospel or whatever the case may be, whatever that opportunity may be, even if there seems to be some sort of obstacle or something that we have to encounter, we should remember that the Lord has given us that opportunity. He's there with us, and we need to, if you will, seize that opportunity and go through the proverbial metaphorical door. So hopefully that helps with that question. Now for our Bible trivia question for this episode, who ripped a lion apart with only his bare hands? So let me read it again. Who ripped a lion apart with only his bare hands? To get the answer to this, we'll be looking in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 14 and verses 5 through 6 give us this answer. Now, many of you probably, if you think of examples of strong individuals, and in particular you can tell from the question that it's a male one of those is Samson. Samson has a lot of interesting aspects to his life. But one of the things that a lot of people know about Samson is that he is often seen as almost a superhero, superhuman in terms of his strength. But of course, Samson's strength was truly from the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. But we're going to read Judges chapter 14, verses 5 through 6. This is actually the first example of where Samson shows this extraordinary faith. We'll also see where it is actually, in fact, the Lord who gives that to him. But in Judges chapter 14, verses 5 through 6, we, had, we find the answer to the question. Then Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyards. And behold, a young lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So there we see the answer to the question, which is, Samson was the one who ripped apart a lion who was coming towards him, with only his bare hands, of course, noting that superhuman, supernatural strength. But of course, you notice as I was reading it in verse 6, 
In fact, his strength came from the Lord himself. Before we finish, Leon Wood has a helpful quote here. In his commentary on Judges, he says, This is the indication of the time when Samson first became strong. The Spirit of God now came on him to impart his unique strength. It had to be the Spirit of the Lord who gave him the power. Of course, this should remind believers today that with the power of the Holy Spirit, God also gives us the power to do what we could not do otherwise or on our own. For our final question for this episode, Pastor, where does the term Christian come from? Now, this is a good question, and uh, the reason why I say that is I think sometimes we maybe take it for granted, the term, uh, a term that's so familiar, but it's a good question. I'm going to answer the question in just a second, but I ran across an article not too long ago on cbsnews.com, and it was speaking about how Christianity in the United States has shrunk, their words. It says, for example, in the early 90s, about 90% of people in the United States identified themselves as, as Christians. In 2020, 64%. So you see there that what's happening is that there is a decline, at least, in Christianity today. And I think there are various factors for that. But this plays into the question we're looking at, because what does it mean by Christian? Because I think you would get different responses if we clarified what the term means. The term basically Christian means someone who has, by faith alone, trusted in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Uh, they belong to him. They are one of his own, and they have placed their eternal destiny in Jesus Christ. So this would be apart from anything man may try to do, earn salvation, and all of those many other types of things, some of which aren't even bad things, but Nevertheless, to be a Christian means to be one who has trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And so I think just by that very statement, you're going to probably have a reduction of it. And of course, I think there's other factors involved with the decline of Christianity. I'm going to read here from Elmer Towns, who says, The name Christian designates those who belong to Christ Jesus, who have been saved, or as we sometimes say, born again. So I think that that's helpful there, uh, those definitions. Now, back to the question. So we kind of have an idea of the term, what it means, and I think it's good to remember what that term means. But we also need to turn to the scripture, and we know in the Bible it is used three times. But again, it's always to those who are in Christ. So these aren't individuals who have other criteria so much as they are identified with Jesus Christ. So let's look at these three. The first two actually come from the book of Acts. And this tells us when was the first time the term Christian was used. So again, you have the aspect of the church and those sorts of things, but when was the term, which is what the question was asking, where does where does it come from, what does it mean? So having determined what it means, we see in Acts chapter 11 in verse 26, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So that's the first of the three. The second is in Acts 26 verse 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. So again there, the identification is with Jesus Christ, not so much with empty religion or those sorts of things, but clearly it's an identification with Jesus Christ. The last one is in 1 Peter 4.16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. And so what I want us to see here is that, of course, this is a designation Christian is, and it relates to someone who belongs to Jesus, who is trusted in Christ alone. And it's never 
designated to an unbeliever. It is never designated to someone who is not part of the body of Christ. So what we need to remember is, of course, the term comes from the Bible. We see it as a, if you will, progression of the primitive church. Uh, as the book of Acts moves along, we see that in Acts 11. We saw that in Acts 26. And by the latter ministry period, there with 1 Peter 4.16. And it's always designated with those who have trusted in Jesus Christ by faith alone. And of course, that prompts us to ask ourselves, well, am I a Christian? A Christian is one who has trusted in Jesus Christ alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, and is not looking towards their works. Uh, so they're not trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, as well as his resurrection, confirming that he was who he claimed to be. I've always found John 5.24 to be helpful. Just in brief, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death and into life. You notice there that, again, it is belief in Christ, the one the Father sent, and they have eternal life. It's not something that they would obtain by good works, but, of course, gives the idea, for instance, like what we see in Romans with the gift of God. So my hope and prayer is, if you're listening to this, that you have trusted in Christ and that you are one who could say, I am a Christian because I have trusted not in myself, but in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, that concludes today's episode. I appreciate everyone listening, and we'll look forward to our time again soon. And so be sure to tune in for our next episode. Until then, God bless.